<clears throat> then right before church, he's, he, he came in my office and he said, Dad, I, I can't sing this special. He said, I just found out it's the same song that Tony sang this morning on the battlefield. And I said, that's okay. That's all right. We love it just the same. Amen. Amen. Done. Done. <clears throat> Genesis 13 and Philippians chapter 4. I got a late start, but it is a shorter message. Miss Darla's got her heater. I've got my fan. We're ready to go. <laughs> we all got our things here. Genesis chapter 13, Philippians chapter 4. I've always loved Sunday nights. It's always been my favorite service. Um, you know, the I just love it. You know, the people that are here uh, in general are here because they want to serve the Lord and worship the Lord, not just putting in a time slot. And I'm not... I'm making fun of anybody that can only make it on a Sunday morning, but I'm just, in general, uh, I feel like it's a little more relaxed, a little less formal. Uh, oftentimes, I used to be, you get a nap in and you're feeling really good, you know. Uh, I, I miss those days. <clears throat> now I get a nap while I'm sitting like this on my computer, <laughs> and I wake up every so often. <coughs> I love Sunday nights. Uh, I love our church. I love the spirit here. Uh, I enjoy Wyatt doing push-ups this evening. That was awesome. Amen. We've been, uh, we're going to continue just take another step or two forward in the life of Abraham. We've been kind of going through it a little bit, and I want to keep, keep, keep that going tonight. Uh, last week we saw Abram chose to go to Egypt during the famine, which I'm sure made perfect sense. I'm sure it did. But he, he, it appears that he was out of fellowship with God while he was in Egypt. Uh, as far as the scriptures are concerned there's no evidence that he was in fellowship with God in fact while he was in Egypt he found himself uh, convincing uh, slash forcing his family to tell lies which of course caused bigger problems about his wife being his sister but I mean which I mean I just can't imagine falling into that um, Abram ended up leaving Egypt getting back in fellowship with God but all the while the sin of his lies, the sin of being in a place where he shouldn't have been, that caused a lot of pain and suffering for all those people in Pharaoh's house. Not to mention that Abram's testimony was not good in that entire place because he's a liar. Even if we would have done the same, at the end of the day, he was lying. He was not putting his trust in the Lord. He's putting his trust in his own wisdom. And as far as the world's concerned, it's probably a smart move to do. But it wasn't until he got back to where he uh, last had his communion with God where he began to call upon God again. Let's pick up Genesis chapter 13, verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt and his wife and all that he had and lied with him into the south. And Abram was uh, very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to uh, Bethel into the place where his tent had been at the beginning uh, between Bethel and Hai, into the place of the altar which you had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. <coughs> Brother Tony, would you pray as we get into the message, sir? Amen. Genesis 13, verse 5. Let's keep on reading. It says, And Lot also, which went with Abraham, or Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. That's his nephew, by the way. <clears throat> and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their sus substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife, and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite, uh, and, uh, colon, and the Canaanite and the Parasite dwelled there then in the land. Now, just pause there for a moment because this isn't in my notes or nothing, but um, why would he throw that in there? But look at that. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, colon, and the Canaanite and the Parasite dwelled in the land. What a shame that there's strife between two brothers in the family. Oh, and the world's watching. Whether it's strife in the church or another brother in Christ, oh, and the world's watching. I believe that's what's being said here. Verse 8, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. 
Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. <coughs> Abram shows Lot favor and great grace and great generosity by Abram. <coughs> Look at verse 10. Then Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was, uh, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Basically, Lot is pulling the classic foolish card. He's happy to take the good route and stick his uncle into the harshest parts of the desert. Who does that? Somebody just selfish. I mean, that's worse than taking the biggest slice of pie. But when there's a small slice of pizza, a big slice of pizza, you take the big slice. Or you break two halves of something to split it and you're taking the big half, right? It's the same mentality, just on a bigger scale. This is more like Lot saw the last glass of water in the desert and said, I'll take that water, you can have nothing. Lot is making his decision purely based on physical observation of his surroundings. We can apply that to our lives. Lot, Lot in this scenario was taking the role of the fool. <coughs> Proverbs 1, 7, you don't have to turn there. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You ever want to take a path, on, if you understand what it is to be a fool, just, just go right through Proverbs because there's like 30 or 40 verses Ever so many verses, you can find it, you can Google it, you can use your concordance. Just go through it. Just for, We almost did it tonight, but I opted not to. Just go through, and you can do it in five minutes when you have your list. Just go through one verse, next chapter, next chapter. And God lays out what a fool is. Amen. In fact, I, I think I preached a message on it one time. <clears throat> but Lot didn't consider how his, his decision would affect his family Spiritually, he was only thinking carnally in which direction he wanted to go. What do we do with the Bible? We use it as a mirror. We apply it to our own lives. Says, so I'm studying this. I'm applying it to my life, <clears throat> and I'm thinking to myself, how often do I make decisions and never consider what God wants for me and my family? How many times am I doing that? Like, like, let me do a gut check on myself, and let me extend that to the church. How many times are we making decisions? We're not even praying about it. We're just thinking, no, oh, this is the best decision. I'll just do it real quick. This is what we'll do. And we just do it without even praying about it. You know, somebody once said, just because the door is open doesn't mean that God opened it. And we say it all the time, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not, lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will What? But direct thy paths. Don't we want God leading us? He just obey his word. Amen. Go to Philippians 4 6. Philippians 4 6. Pretty cool. Rachel's got that up. The address is up there. Yeah. We put that up there so Tony would quit complaining. <laughs> uh <laughs> Amen. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in what? Everything. By what? Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what are we supposed to pray about? Everything. We don't. I'm telling you, we don't. We don't pray about everything. But man, wouldn't we be so much the wiser if we just did? I'm talking from the pulpit to the pew, guys. We just pray about everything. Man, God would direct. We'd be so easily, you know, God, God it's easier to, to direct something that's already moving. If you're going to sit there and do nothing for the Lord, it's hard for God to get you moving. But if you're already doing something, all you got to do is just tap you a little bit and you'll... You move, amen. 
And that's only happening through constant prayer and supplication. Pray without ceasing. That's our theme this year. Prayer. Amen. Back to our text, Genesis 13, 12. I hope you didn't lose your original place in Genesis. Miss Darla didn't. She's good. Amen. Genesis 13, 12. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. What does that mean to pitch your tent towards Sodom? That means, that means if Sodom is here and Romulus is over here, you're going to pitch your tent over towards Sodom. I'm going over here. Not over, I'm going to, I want to go over to Sodom. That's where I'm going to put my tent. Toward Sodom. You say, well, what's wrong with Lot pitching his tent towards Sodom? <coughs> the next verse tells us. <coughs> but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord a really little bit. Just barely. They, they were just sinful a little bit. No, it says they were wicked before the Lord exceedingly. So wicked, in fact, that literally the term sodomy comes from the people of Sodom, this place called Sodom. That's where we get the word sodomy. What's sodomy? It literally means, according to Webster's 1828, a crime against nature. Let's turn a few times, then we'll close. Turn to Levit Leviticus 18.22. Say, Pastor, what do you mean? We're not going to get in detail, but it means men were getting together with men and women with women. That which is against nature, having wicked and inappropriate sexual relations one with another and of the same sex. And we'll just hit two portions of Scripture just to clarify things in case there's any question or anybody's online at any time that's listened to this message Leviticus 18, 22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Uh, you'll find some people that will say, Well, that's under the law. We're not under that. Then I guess this doesn't apply to you. <laughs> that is so ridiculous. Their principles don't follow through. Amen. Verse 23, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Defile not yourselves in any of these. For in all of these, look at this, for in all of these, the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. Notice when this is written, Leviticus, they just come out of the Red Sea. They just come out of Egypt. In that 400 years that they were in bondage, and all that time, <coughs> then all the other nations already filled with sodomy. It's no new thing. There's no new thing under the sun. It's been around for a long time. That sinful gay lifestyle was around in Abraham's time. Amen. Turn to Romans 1.26. <coughs> When the preacher in Ecclesiastes, Solomon, said that there's no new thing under the sun, he was talking about the sin of man, the nature of man. <clears throat> he wasn't talking about that there was iPods 5,000 years ago. <clears throat> no. No. He was talking about the sinful nature of man. Romans 1.26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use. Uh, into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to, to do those things which are not convenient. That's a scarier verse than we might realize. That they got so sinful, they, they reached a point where God said, I'm, I'm done, go. I'm just going to give you over to a reprobate mind. That's a scary thought. But this is the wickedness that was in Sodom. That's the kind of wickedness that, that, there, that the Bible's talking about was exceedingly wicked. Not a little wicked, but exceedingly wicked. <coughs> And these are the people that Sodom was filled with. And this is the place that, that, that Lot was drawn to, not necessarily because of the sin, we don't know, but because, man, they had, 
it was a beautiful place and it was happening. It was a healthy city as far as finances go. How awful is that, that, that we would, we would, what's the word I'm looking for? We would, um, um, We would compromise what's right, what we know to be right, for whatever convenience or pleasures we might see. And 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 I'm anything. Pick any example. Um, if uh, you want to hang out with your buddies at work, and, and you're starving, you've been working 14, 16, 18 hour days. And they're all going uh, down the road to the bar. Man, you're starving. You want to go? That food's good, Tony. It's good food. But what a horrible example, you're going to the bar late at night. What a horrible witness. But you know, but I mean, like, it's not the end of the world. I mean, really, like, not everybody's going to see you, and you're going to get filled, and God wants you to be happy and full, right? And you worked all day, you got to eat anyways. You, you start compromising, thinking, Lot was looking at Sodom, saying, man, this guy, they can take care of all of our needs, and we can thrive with, uh, financially, and, and we can be healthy there, we can... We can grow and we can be good as a family. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of sin there. And, and it's probably not good for my children or my children's children, uh, right? But God's not as important as our finances, America. Amen. Turn to Philippians 2, 3. A couple more scriptures and we'll close. Lot pitched, pitched his tent towards Sodom. You know what else that means? He's going in that direction. He's thinking about it all day long. He's looking to what uh, Sodom has to offer. As always, when we read the Word of God, we apply it to our lives, right? Where are we pitching our tent? Is it more towards the world or is it towards the Word of God? I mean, we know that the decision, I know that uh, uh, here, here we are and I'm going to pitch my tent more towards the world. I mean, you know, the, the, my job's the most important, so I'm going to uh, make that the most priority. I'm going to, uh, living in this city is, is going to take care of me even more, so I'm going to put more of my time into this. I know that it's going to hurt my family spiritually, but I really like this over here. I don't think that Lot was putting God as a priority or the spirituality of his family as a priority. But you keep moving, telling yourself that the sacrifice is worth the pleasure, that the, sacri the spiritual sacrifice is worth the convenience of what you'll get by living in Sodom. And this is the character of Lot, which is the opposite of what Abraham has taken. Abram, he's taking the biblical position. Man, good character, God honoring. I can't wait to meet him one day. Paul described how we should act to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Could you imagine if we came to the church house, and I'm being dead serious, and I came in the church house with, <coughs> with, a, with a mindset of, me and my boys, you don't count. <laughs> mindset of, man, I hope Jimmy's doing better than I am today. I hope, I hope what can I do for Miss Kathy today? Because I care more about her than myself. Miss Dollar's got a heater. She's fine. But what can I do for Jen today? How can I be a blessing to her? I care more. I, wouldn't it be great if I cared more about Tony's needs today than mine? All of a sudden, it'd be a lot harder to be bitter at her brothers and sisters. All of a sudden, when Tony does something absolutely that I thought was just horribly dumb, I can't think of a good example. But if he did something I just disagreed with or I hated, he sang, maybe he sang a song that I didn't like. It'd be awfully hard for me to get upset at him when I'm already thinking how much I love him and I want to be a blessing to him. That's what Paul was telling them to the, the uh, Philippians, was it? Philippians, amen. 
We seem to have more lots in the world than we do Abraham's. We seem to have more lots in the churches than we do Abraham's. Turn to Matthew 6, 24. We'll close on this verse. It'd be good. Oh, man, it'd be good. From the pulpit to the pew, if we could just put our egos aside and put our bitterness aside and just grow in the Lord. Quit being offended at every little top hat that comes away, looking for reasons to be offended and just say, hey, I want to serve God. I want to be a blessing to somebody else in the church. Man, it'll, it, you want to talk about a spirit of unity, that'll, that'll, that'll grow it right there. We know how things turned out for Lot and his family. Then why do we pitch our tent towards Sodom all the time and fall into the same trap that he did? It didn't work out for him. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You realize he's saying you're pitching your tent either one way or the other. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I know we know these things. We know these principles. We, we know Bible stories. We know Daniel in the lion's den. We know... Adam and Eve we know these things but the problem is we get settled in in the church we say I'm saved I've been saved for so long I'm good to go I got it and we quit applying these truths to our lives as if we've reached some sort of spiritual pinnacle we're like I don't need to apply this anymore I no no and everything and everything by prayer and supplication by thanksgiving. Paul said, hey, esteem them more than you esteem yourself. These are basic things that we learn as children. But we have a sinful nature and we forget. I forget. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for your word. <coughs> I pray, God, that you would move in the next.